Hello and welcome to Undaunted Courage. We are excited for all of you that are here and we're also very excited for those of you joining us online. Now I do have an announcement for you guys online. We're about to have our Q&A after this presentation that we're about to have by Brother Clifford Goldstein. We're going to continue diving into the topic of creation and evolution and science. How does that fit in if you're a Christian? So we're, we're going to learn more in just a moment. And after that presentation by Brother Cliff, all the speakers are going to come out again, and we're going to take your questions. Now, we're going to take live questions. We're going to have someone with a roaming mic, so when you have a question, raise your hand. They'll come around and get your question. For those of you that are viewing online, if you just go to the Amazing Facts Facebook page, and in the comment section there, put in your questions, and we will get those and ask them as soon as we can during the panel. Also, we want to make sure that you guys remember outreach coming up, so make sure that you get your t-shirts. And at this time, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then Brother Cliff will come out and share with us. So, oh, wait, wait, wait. Did I tell you guys about the free offer? No, I didn't. Free offer. For those of you viewing online, uh, we'll put up on the screen the free offer for you guys if you're just now joining us. We have an exciting free offer for you. It's called The Ultimate Resource written by Pastor Doug. If you would like to get a digital copy of this, just text the code REDISCOVER to 40544. All right, so now let's pray, and then we'll hear from Brother Cliff. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we can come together again and study more. And we pray, Father, that you would just open up our hearts, and we ask that you be with Brother Cliff in a very special way, that you would give him the words to say, that you would give him a clarity of thought, and that we would all draw closer to you as a result of this study. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Very quick review. I can't emphasize how important this point is. Just because a scientific theory works, just because you can make accurate predictions, just because you can use the theory even to create technology, that's a totally separate issue from whether the theory is true or not. Again, remember my visible spiders from Mars theory. It worked. That evidence of my theory. Okay, now the reason I bring that up is because it's very easy to get bamboozled. And maybe by well-meaning people, they say, well, the science works. The science gets us to the moon. The science helps us build spacecraft that builds airplanes, splices genes. Therefore, the theory behind it has to be true. We can marvel at the technology that science gives us. We can use it. But we always have to be a little bit skeptical about grand pronouncements they make about truth. Because many, many scientific theories that people believed for years that created technology have ultimately been overturned. Nobody believes them anymore. So that's one part. The other part Something else now. A couple years ago, I was driving to work at the GC, and I was supposed to give morning worship. And I had my worship planned out. And as I was driving, this beautiful rainbow, just this one of the most magnificent rainbows I'd ever seen, just filled this, just this beautiful, like, McDonald arch, kind of, except just yellow. It was much prettier 
than the McDonald Arch, you know, and the colors on the rainbow. I mean, it really took my breath away. And anyway, I get to work, and I'm standing up in the pulpit getting ready to give worship, and I say, you know, and I close my iPad or whatever, I say, you know, I'm going to scare you. I had a worship planned, but I'm going to ad lib it because of the rainbow. The rainbow inspired me to talk about something else. And when I saw the rainbow in the sky, of course, what do you think of? The book of Genesis. Prior to the flood, it never rained, okay? The rain comes, the flood comes, kills everything. People come back, and according to the Bible, and Ellen White filled it in, God put the rainbow in the sky as his promise to the world that he would never destroy the world with a flood okay, again, okay? And I'm driving to work, and I see the rainbow up there, and I kind of smiled a little and thought to myself, well, obviously that's true. Of course, I wouldn't have been there to notice the rainbow had God destroyed the world again with the flood. So it was a little bit of a contradiction there, but at the same time, the fact that I'm there and there's the rainbow in the sky. Symbol, Scripture says, of God's promise that he's not going to destroy the world again with a flood. Now, many of you in public school, any of you go to public schools? Okay, okay, good. Number of you. Now, what do you think would have happened in class? Say you're in class. Somehow the subject of the rainbow comes up. And you raised your hand. And you said, well, I believe the rainbow is a sign from God, his promise that he would never destroy the world again by water. How do you think people might respond? What do you think they might have said? Anybody? What do you think? If they weren't believers? Well, I know what I would have said. When I was younger, I would have said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you, know, what, what, you know, that's, uh, what, are you, a, what are you, an imbecile? Come on, come on. We know what a rainbow is. Science has revealed to us what a rainbow is. And you know, it's actually the, the science can get fairly complicated when you try to describe a rainbow. The mathematical formulas, you've got the water and the light and there's reflection and there's refraction. There's a whole lot of stuff going on that science has investigated and science can describe and science can explain to a certain degree Though it's very interesting if you get in on the topic of does science explain, but I'm not going to get into that. But seriously, how could anybody in the 21st century with what science has revealed to us about the rainbow, how could you possibly Believe what the Bible says, that God put this in the sky as a promise that he won't destroy the world with a flood. Okay? It's reasonable. On the surface. 
But on another level, it's totally, totally irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant what science says. Even if everything science says is right, what do I mean? Well, if you were to read your Bible, if you were to open it up and read, and God says, and I will, I will weave together angels' feathers, and I'll weave angels' feathers together in the sky and create a rainbow in the sky to show you that I will never destroy the world by flood again. We would have a problem, wouldn't we? We would have a problem if Scripture said, I will we, God says, I will weave together angel feathers. Well, you know, I read my Bible. It doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't say one word on how God is going to put the rainbow in the sky. It just says that he's going to do it. So the question is, what is it about the fact that we have somewhat of a, quote, scientific understanding of the rainbow? What is it about science explaining or describing the reflection and the refraction and the colors? What is it about that understanding that somehow makes the biblical story false? I can't think of anything. The God, God created our world in such a way that under certain conditions, when light and water meet, you get this beautiful rainbow in the sky. And God uses that, the way he created the world, to say to humanity, trust me, I'm not going to destroy the world by water again. Can you see the point here? The, the fact that we have certain, we have a deeper understanding, the fact that science has given us a deeper understanding about certain physical phenomena does absolutely nothing to take away the fact that God had done it. If anything, it's like, wow, science has given me and it's given us a deeper understanding of how God made the sign. See what I'm saying? It's one doesn't contradict the other. Now the reason, this is just one example, the reason I bring this up is there's this idea, there was a, a, a writer, he died now, sad story, his name was Christopher Hitchens, was an atheist, and he said everything time the microscope peers deeper into the world and every time the telescope peers farther out they're pushing God and God further and further away and I would have loved to have asked him I'd, because I'd be curious as to what he would answer I would have liked to have said, Mr. Hitchens, what is the telescope going to find? What do you think the telescope could find? Or what do you think the microscope would find that would ultimately show that there is no God? Okay? And I, I, to this day, I'm really wondering what they, you know, they say that the more... The more they show, the less God, the more and more God is pushed out of the picture. And I'm just very, you hear that all the time, and yet it's, it's just another myth. You could argue that the more science shows, in fact, I, I heard one guy, one guy, this guy's fascinating. This, he's a chemist. 
And he argues that bit by bit science is going to push God out until it proves that our universe was created from absolutely nothing. This is his argument. He wants to argue that the universe was created from absolutely nothing. And you know what? Because he absolutely rejects an eternal existing God. He absolutely rejects it. And we're going to look at this a little more tomorrow. The, most, the only other logical option he has for the creation of the universe is absolutely nothing. Now, think about this. Let's say you found a famous formula, and this was considered the most foundational formula. This is the formula that they believe could explain everything from the creation of the universe, the creation of atoms, the creation of human life. It's, there, it's called a theory of everything. And there's this idea that at some point, if they keep breaking things down, eventually they'll get to this bottom line fundamental thing. And that will be the theory that explains everything. That's their hope, okay? Now, let's just say, hypothetically, that they find this theory. Okay, let's just say there is, it's, it's out there, which I question to begin with, but a lot smarter people than I am think it is. And let's say they find it. Okay, they find it. And let's say the theory, I'm just throwing anything out, is X plus Y equals Z. Okay, that's the fundamental theory of everything. That's the theory upon which we could explain all life, all existence, you know, human emotions, everything. Let's say they find it. Okay. That does, though, leave one little question. Why X? Why Y? Why Z? Okay, there, there's something, you know, they're there. How do you explain it? Well, maybe they got something behind it. Well, it's X because of this, and it's Y because of this, and it's Z because of this. But wait a minute then. If that's explaining it, then it's not the fundamental theory. Maybe it's P plus Q equals R. That explains how you get to that X plus Y equals Z. All right, fine. P plus Q equals R. Well, do you see a problem here? Why P? Why Q? Why R? Well, you go, you got a fundamental, you know, a hundred years later, they find an even more fundamental one. You know, A plus B equals C. And it goes on and on forever. No matter what they come up with, they have to, it has to be explained. Okay, so they're right back at where they, why this, why that. Now, as far as I can tell, there's only two, op you have only two options. To get out of, they call this infinite regress. You just keep going back. As far as I can tell, there's only two ways out of that. Number one, you have an eternal existing God, like the God in the Bible who doesn't need an explanation because God was always there. He was eternal existing. There was nothing before or behind God. He was always there. So to ask where did God come from, it's a silly question. 
He was always there. The only other option to get you out of that is that the universe arose from absolutely nothing. Nothing. It's, it doesn't need an explanation. Because what are you explaining? There's nothing there. So it, 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 they use, they're, they're forced to argue the universe arose from nothing. So, in other words, because this man absolutely refuses, refuses to believe in God, his only other logical recourse is that the universe arose from absolutely nothing. So I'll leave it to you to decide which you think is the more, is the better option. Okay, so think about that in terms of scientific explaining. How did the universe get it? Well, this created it. Well, that did and so on. And you go back and back. Or you have an absolutely, you have God or you have absolutely nothing. Now, I talked to you yesterday. Again, this question of, but it's science. And all your Christian life, if you're following the Lord and you're going to stick to the Bible, particularly on creation, you are going to constantly be confronted. But it's science. It's science. And the idea is that you have to bow before it bow before it, and, well, science says it, and you, you know, the, the title of this series is Undaunted Courage. You are going to need courage, particularly you go away to, if you go away to secular colleges. You might even need some of it at Adventist colleges, but I didn't say that, did I? But to stick for creation, you're going to have to have some courage. And you're going to, and what I hope if you come away with this at all is you don't have to, oh, it's science, it's science. You don't have to. We're not anti science. I am not anti science. But I'm not one of these that falls flat on my face and kowtows before just because it says it's science. I remember for decades, the tobacco industry, I mentioned to you this yesterday, hired scientists who did science, who for years said, science shows we really can't show tobacco is bad. And who am I to challenge PhDs in chemistry, in biology, in physics, who say, no, we've got evidence you, that, that we don't, we, we, or you can't prove scientifically that tobacco is bad for you. It's the same way you might think, well, who am I to challenge the PhDs who say evolution, billions of years of evolution is true. That's science as well. Just like what the scientists said that tobacco didn't hurt you. But you say, but what about, who here has ever heard of the scientific method? I bet you you got, I remember in the fifth grade, the fifth grade being taught the scientific method. And it's the idea that if you apply the scientific method to something, then you're guaranteed or you're verily sure that you're going to be able to find truth. Okay, you know, and, and there's different, you hear, you, scientist comes up with an idea, hypotheses, he does experiments, he tests it. They make it all sound very simple and very straightforward. But you know, their books have been written 
by people denying there's any such thing as the scientific method. Whole books have been written on this by saying it's not true. I mean, there's a famous story in the history of science about a scientist who had a dream. He had a dream of a snake eating its tail. And he says when he woke up for the, from the dream, that gave him what he needed to eventually he discovered the shape of some famous chemical molecule that we now believe is correct. But he got it from a dream about a snake. You're gonna, that's the scientific method? Johannes Kepler, you guys, have, have anybody, you've heard the name Kepler? He was one of the early, good, one of the early astronomers who helped break the world away from the old system. He, he was partially a sun worshiper and he did astrology and he credited his sun worshiping and his astrology with helping him come up with some of the foundation principles that are still used to this day to explain or to describe the orbits of the planets, okay? As I said, there's a whole group of people who question the existence of the scientific method. So the reason I bring that up is when someone says, well, but we apply the scientific method to this, that's fine, but that doesn't mean, again, you have to fall down before it, okay? Now, a number of years ago, a guy wrote a book, and it's to this day, this book has caused controversy. And basically, and, and to this day, philosophers of science and people wrestle with the questions this guy brought up. And this guy argues, you know, we, you have this idea, you have this idea of this purely objective, neutral scientist who's going to look at the world from a neutral, objective viewpoint and then build his scientific theories, no preconceived notion, no prejudices, nothing, just this purely absolute, objective, rational view of the world. And this guy wrote this book in 1962, just devastating this argument. And people have been arguing with this ever since. And nobody really knows how to refute him. You really can't refute him. You know, in other words, some argue that they don't even know what to look for without having a theory or an idea of the world beforehand. So they don't even know what to look for. Someone said all facts are theory laden. Think about that. How do you interpret a fact? You already come in with your preconceived notions. Let me give you the most important example for us. And that's Charles Darwin. What you think Darwin just had no idea, had no idea at all of how life arose, completely blank slate, and then one day he goes on the ship, the Beagle, and he goes to the Galapagos Islands. And he's looking around objectively, rationally, no preconceived notions. And he notices these changes in these species. And then suddenly, just voila, out of nowhere, he gets the idea of evolution. Darwin, the idea of evolution had already been around. People had been promoting it. His grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had written a long poem promoting the idea of evolution. 
Darwin already believed in some degree to evolution already. So when he was looking, he was looking for what he believed would be evidence to prove what he had already believed. He didn't just make it up out of the, out of the blue. It would be very naive to think that he didn't, he didn't have these preconceived notions. But anyway, according to this book, scientists, here's a fancy word for you, you ought to know it. It's called a paradigm. You've probably heard the word, a paradigm. It's not that, I don't know. But it's, a paradigm is sort of the worldview. It's the belief system that you have. And it's the belief system that you look at the world through. And everybody has one. I have one, I admit. I look at the world through the paradigm of Scripture and a very conservative view of Scripture. That's my paradigm. An evolutionist will look at the world through an evolutionary. The point I want to make is we all have paradigms. We don't come at the world neutral. Of course, the million-dollar question is you want to have the right paradigm. Okay? But the reason I'm bringing this up is don't get caught up again. This is the idea. I'm trying to free you from this idea. Well, science says it, therefore we have to cow down to it and listen to it. And I want to read you a quote. I want to read you a quote from this book. The book, it's a famous book, it's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Okay, it's kind of a heavy read. You guys might be a bit young to get into it now, but it's been one of the most influential books of the 20th century. But I want to read you something that he says in here. And he's quoting another scientist. He says, a new scientific truth, or we'll say a paradigm, does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with the new paradigm. What? Wait a minute. What, what are you, we're talking science here. Okay, with well, science, I mean, one generation dies off who never believed it, and a new generation happens to believe it, and that's how it becomes established truth. Whoa, whoa, that's not how it's commonly presented in the public, is it? One generation dies off, new generation, and now, whoa, maybe the new generation is right. Maybe the old was wrong, but man, is that how a truth is established? I mean, come on. You know, I want to give you an example. I listened <clears throat> to a series of <coughs> lectures from a place called the Teaching Company. And it was 34 lectures on the origins of life. And the, auth the, the lecturer, I want to read you, I want to give you the lecturer's paradigm. I want to give you what the lecturer assumed. Because basically the paradigm is not what you try to prove. The paradigm is what you use to prove everything else. So he gave this lecture, 36 lectures on the origins of life, and I want to read you what his paradigm was, what he started out with. He says, I want to start out with, okay, let me see, where was it? Come on, where were we? All right. He starts out, all right. He starts, oh yeah, he says, he works from the assumption that life started by chance about three billion years ago through the processes of chemistry and physics. Okay? Notice, 
This is what he started out with. That life began by chance three billion years ago through the processes of chemistry and physics that exist today. Okay? So again, remember, he's not questioning this. He's not challenging this. This is his foundation. And anything that doesn't fit that gets thrown out. Well, what was fascinating was he then spent most of the lecture looking at different theories that people had based on the paradigm. Okay, somebody started out you know, they started out saying, life began in, you've all heard that, life began in a shallow pool of water. Okay, that's the common one, sometimes you hear it. And he told about these scientists who did these experiments, and that was the big theory, everybody believed it. Well, a few years later, other scientists came along it said, no, 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 that's a bunch of garbage. Life began in a thermal vent underneath the sea. Okay, and then for a while, everybody was into that. Again, three billion years ago, through the process of chemistry and physics. Well, then other people came by and said, no, 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 that's not true. Life began, one of them even argued, life began in molten lava. A thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that was one of the theories. And others came by, and the point is, he went on and on and on, showing why each one, each one overturned the other one. And when you got to the end, they didn't have any answers. Now, what fascinated me about this and it was a perfect example of what this man in this book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, argued. He never, it never one time, I believe, entered into the man's mind that none of these theories worked. The thousand degree molten lava, the, the, the underground vent, whatever it worked. It never entered his mind that they didn't work because his initial paradigm that life began three billion years ago and by chance through the processes of chemistry and physics. It never entered his mind to challenge it because that was the thing they were using to test everything. You know what it reminds me? Imagine a football game. Oh, somehow I got a headache. Maybe all this clean air out here, I don't know. The nice weather, I'm used to steamy, hot. I, where, oh, where was I? Oh yeah, okay. A football game. When they throw the yellow flag, are they challenging? the rules of football? When they throw the flag, are they, are they saying, hey, we need to look at whether what clipping really is. We need to look again at what roughing the kicker is. We need to look again at what we mean by offsides. No, 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 the yellow flag, the rules, the rules themselves determine why the yellow flag is being thrown. They never throw the yellow flag in order to challenge the rules. And that's exactly what a paradigm is, okay? Now, that's all fine. I guess, ultimately, science has to work through a paradigm. You have to have a certain set of assumptions which you use to check things. Well, that's great. And that's fine, but what happens, 
What happens if your entire paradigm happens to be wrong? I mean, what happens if the whole foundation and ever you know, it would almost be like, and I'm using analogies here, so they always weak, but just popped into my head, go back to the football thing. Suppose you, and maybe this isn't good, suppose you started using the rules of basketball and applied those rules to the NFL. Okay, you'd have a little problem here, wouldn't you? What, what, anyway, but the point is, what do you do in the case I happen to believe that all these lectures, 36 lectures, again, it was fascinating, it's very fascinating to me to believe what I believe and to listen to all these brilliant, educated people just go down one, what I believe, one rabbit hole after another, after another. Because when he got done, he admitted, we don't know. None of those theories worked. He'll admit it. He admits none of these theories worked. But I don't think it ever entered his mind to think, well, maybe none of these theories work. Because my assumption, which again, he did not challenge, that life began by chance three billion years ago through the laws of chemistry and physics was flat out wrong. And how, and it is wrong, and I'm going to talk tomorrow, I'm going to talk tomorrow about, I'm going to ask the question, why does science which gets so much right, and I put that word right in quotes, because again, again, there's some people who would argue science really gets nothing right in terms of you're looking for truth. If you're terms if you're looking for descriptions and predictions, it works magnificently. But why, when science gets so much right, does it get origins wrong? Because really, if what we believe is true, and I believe it's true, then man, science does not only get it wrong. Woo! <laughs> I mean, it's got it radically, radically, radically wrong. But we'll look at that tomorrow, and the answer might surprise you. Surprise you. But anyway, come back to this. Suppose the whole framework is wrong. You know, one of my favorite quotes, one of my favorite quotes from the history of science was a fellow named Francis Bacon. He lived in the 17th century. And the paradigm, because now that you guys have been educated a little bit in the philosophy of science, you know what the word means. The paradigm for a century, for, for a thousand years, was the philosophy of Aristotle and Aristotle's worldview, which we talked about that yesterday, which put the earth immobile at the center of the universe and everything orbited. Well, there was a whole lot more to Aristotle. That was the paradigm in which everything was studied, was judged by, he had to sign an oath when he went to college that anything that contradicted the philosopher, that was the name of Aristotle, he was called the philosopher, that anybody who, that, that you had to throw out anything that contradicted Aristotle. Well, he goes to school, this guy, in many ways he's considered the father of modern science, okay, Bacon. But anyway, I want to read you this quote. I love it. I love it. I, 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 it's amazing. See, he's getting in trouble. He's getting in trouble because he's refusing to follow the paradigm. And in many ways, Aristotle was the Darwin of his age. 
Today, everything is interpreted through Darwin. Back then, everything was interpreted through Aristotle. And he's getting in trouble. And listen to his words. I cannot be called upon to abide by the sentence of a tribunal which is itself on trial. Do you see what he's saying? You want to condemn me because I'm not following Aristotle. But I'm telling you, I believe your whole Aristotle thing is wrong. And that's what's on trial. And in many ways today, what we face with Darwin is the same thing. How many of you, let me give you an example of how influential this was. How many of you ever remember, you've probably all heard the story, the famous story of Galileo Galileo on trial before the Roman Inquisition for teaching that the earth moved among other things. We've all heard that story, probably, you know, and it's given as the prime example as the prime example of ignorant religious people. Ignorant religious people as fighting the progress and progression of science. Have you heard the story, Aristotle? And most people, and my venture to guess that that's how you heard it, that you got this brilliant scientist discovering truth and these close-minded clerics in the Vatican and Rome and so forth, they were fighting against truth and so on. Well, you know, there is a tiny bit of truth to that. But I look at the thing completely different. I'm not going to have time to get into all the details. But... One of the things that they were ready to torture this man, they were going to kill him over, was because he argued that the earth was not the center of the universe. Okay? And they were ready to, you know, string him up for that. And they called it a heresy. Okay, he was teaching heresy, teaching against the Bible. Let me ask you a question. You guys are all Bible students here to some degree, I hope. This is, I can't overestimate how important this is. Would you give me the text, the chapter, the book, the chapter, the verse that has the earth at the center of the universe? Remember, they're ready to, well, I don't think they were ever going to burn him at the stake. They did threaten to torture him. Okay, an old man, they threatened to torture him, but they were going to put him in jail, whatever. But wait a minute, it was heresy. They were charging him with heresy because he denied the earth was at the center of the universe. Nobody's got a Bible text? Anybody? Well, surprise of surprise, no Bible text. Because the Bible never teaches that. Where does the Bible teach? It doesn't teach it. But the problem was they were interpreting the Bible through the latest and greatest science of their time. And the great science of their time, the paradigm, the Darwin of their era was Aristotle. 
In fact, if you go through the four heresies that, Aris, that, that Galileo was accused of teaching, every last one, not one of them, was biblical. It was what the church believed because it interpreted the Bible through the science of its time. And I would argue that theistic evolutionists, the Christians today, and we have them, there are a lot of them. Believe me, if you believe in a literal six-day creation, you are in a minority, even among Christians. But a lot of them, they say we, because it's science, we need to interpret the Bible through Darwin. Because science has shown us millions of years of evolution. And therefore, we have to try to meld it. Well, I would argue that the theistic evolution, contrary to the normal spin which is that the creationists and all that, where the persecuting Catholic, we're symbolic of the Catholic Church, while the brave Galileo seeking science is symbolic of those that are now using science and evolution. I argue the opposite. I argue that the theistic evolutionists, those who are interpreting the Bible, through the lens of Darwin are the equivalent to the Catholic Church today. But here's the difference. Here's the difference, and I'm running out of time here. I wanted to get into this more. Here's the difference, though. Aristotle could have been right. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have made any difference. Suppose the Earth did sit at the center of the universe. Suppose the planets did orbit it. It wasn't an issue that the Bible taught. So even if he was right, what difference did it make? Okay, in other words, Aristotle could have been right, and it makes no difference. I'll say this without any hesitation, and I said it yesterday, and I'll say it again. If science is correct today, the science of origin, and Darwin is right, the billions of years of death and predation and suffering and all that, if that is true, then everything we believe as Christians is false. I challenge there's not one Bible doctrine that we hold that stands up if evolution is true. And so the idea of trying to, to meld evolution with Christianity is just, it's, it's impossible. And I guess I've run out of time here, but I wanted to just give you an example. You ever hear the argument, well, Genesis just tells us that Genesis was written to teach us, to teach the ancient Hebrews that the world wasn't created by the pagans. That's all it was. I mean, it wasn't created by the pagan gods. It was to teach them that, you know, it was created by Yahweh, okay, as opposed to ancient paganism. Well, that's kind of silly. It's kind of silly because all it could have said was, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's all they would have needed to show that all these pagan gods weren't involved in the creation. But God gives us a story of a six-day creation where everything was planned, planned out perfectly, even though in reality, God used billions of years of chance and false starts and death and on and on and on. Why would God give us a story so completely antithetical to what really happened?
Because even evolution at the most basic level, billions of years. And the other thing, too, is evolution teaches we all have one common ancestor. Scripture teaches God created each one after its own kind. Again, the point I'm trying to make is if God really used evolution, if that's how he created, and he gave us the creation story that we have in the Bible, couldn't he have done a better job of explaining what really happened? I'll end on this note, and then we'll pick up tomorrow. I wish... So you'll meet theistic evolutionists, and they'll tell you, oh, I've got great respect for the Bible, but we just have to interpret it right. The honest ones, they would say something like this, I have great respect for the Bible, but when it comes to origins, we must realize that the first 12 chapters of the Bible teach us absolutely nothing correct about origins and that they actually even set us on the wrong path and if we really want to truly understand origins we've got to get rid we can't take seriously at all anything in the first 12 chapters that's what they would say if they're honest i'm not ready to do that and i would hope none of you would be as well let's pray Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for all the reasons we have to believe your word. And Lord, there's so many forces arrayed against us, so many things pulling in so many different directions to cause us to doubt. And may we cling to your word and cling to the truths in your word, especially something so foundational and important as the doctrine of creation. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.